Ideal Auto Cycle of the Gasoline Engine In the linked video, we explained the working principle of a four-stroke engine in detail. In this video, we will focus on the thermodynamic processes in a four-stroke engine, specifically examining the gasoline engine. As the name implies, gasoline is used as the fuel in gasoline engines. Since the gasoline engine is based on the inventor Nicholas August Otto, it is also called the auto engine and the thermodynamic cycle is called the auto cycle. In auto engines, gasoline can be mixed with air in two main ways to make it combustible. One way is to mix the gasoline outside the cylinder in a so-called carburetor, which is located before the cylinder. This is called external mixture formation. Another way is to mix the fuel directly with the intake air inside the cylinder. This is done through an injector, which adds fuel directly into the combustion chamber of the compressed air. This is referred to as internal mixture formation. In gasoline engines, the throttle valve controls the engine power. It is located in the intake system and regulates the amount of fresh charge entering the engine, thereby controlling the power output of the engine. Now, let's discuss the actual thermodynamic processes during the four strokes of an auto engine. These can be clearly illustrated in a pressure volume diagram, which we will examine in more detail in the following. First, the intake process takes place due to the negative pressure. Next, the compression process begins, which requires work to be done and causes the pressure to rise sharply as the volume decreases. This also causes the temperature to rise to several hundred degrees Celsius. Just before reaching the top dead center, the ignition of the fuel-air mixture begins with the help of a spark plug, therefore called spark ignition. The heat produced by the combustion of the gases causes the temperature and pressure to rise dramatically. This drives the piston downwards, and the expanding gases convert thermal energy into mechanical energy, which is transmitted to the crankshaft. After the gases have expanded, the exhaust valve opens and the burned gases are expelled at low overpressure as they cool. The process then begins again. The gases in the cylinder are generally referred to as the charge. The resulting loop in the diagram during the exhaust and intake of the charge is therefore called the charge exchange loop. The auto cycle just explained is mathematically difficult to describe. Therefore, the thermodynamic processes in an auto engine are often considered under idealized conditions. This is called the ideal auto cycle. In such an ideal cycle, it is first assumed that the intake and exhaust processes occur at the same pressure. In the simplest case, this pressure corresponds to the ambient pressure, unless the intake manifold pressure is increased by a compressor to deliver more air mass to the engine. As a result, no work is required for the intake and exhaust of gases. In the diagram, therefore, there is no charge exchange loop. The subsequent compression process in engines generally takes place within a few milliseconds, so it is simply assumed that no significant amount of heat escapes through the cylinder walls during this short period. The compression is therefore considered to take place in an adiabatic system. In the reversible case, this process is then called an isentropic process. After the isentropic compression, heat is supplied by igniting the fuel-air mixture. Due to the rapid combustion, significant piston movement during this phase is neglected. Therefore, in the ideal auto cycle, the combustion process is considered an isochoric heat addition. This is also referred to as constant volume combustion. After isochoric combustion, expansion of the gases takes place, which represents the actual conversion of thermal energy into mechanical work. Due to the rapid expansion, which occurs within a few milliseconds, the heat transfer to the environment is again neglected. As with compression, the expansion process is considered to be isentropic. Finally, the burnt gases are expelled, followed by the intake of the fresh charge. From a thermodynamic point of view, this process corresponds to the cooling of the burned hot gases to the state of the fresh charge. Considering the state just before the exhaust and the state just after the intake, both states have the same volume. Thus, from a thermodynamic point of view, the charge exchange can be considered as an isochoric cooling back to the initial state. Note that in the ideal auto cycle, the state change from 4 to 1 represents the actual charge exchange. To avoid confusion, the idealized charge exchange should not be added to the diagram. Therefore, it is shown only as a dashed line in the diagram. It should also be noted that the drawn state transitions do not allow any conclusions about time. For example, it is not true that the longer the curve of a thermodynamic process, the longer it takes to go through that state change. For example, assuming a nearly constant engine speed, compression, 
combustion and expansion take place during one full revolution of the crankshaft, and thus within the same time as the charge exchange, which also requires one full revolution. Therefore, the process from 1 to 4 takes almost as long as the process from 4 to 1. Now let us take a closer look at the changes in state from an energy point of view. The expansion work done by the gas as it expands and transfers energy to the crankshaft is shown in the diagram as the area under the expansion curve. However, this is not the actual usable work done by the engine. Part of this expansion work must be saved and then used later for compression. The energy required to do this comes primarily from the flywheels attached to the crankshaft, which store some of the expansion work as rotational energy to be used in the next cycle to compress the gas. If all of the expansion work were extracted from the engine, or if so much work were drawn through the crankshaft that there was not enough energy left for compression, the engine would simply stop. Especially when starting off, where a lot of power is required to overcome friction forces, there is a high risk that too much work is transmitted through the crankshaft and manual gearbox to the wheels, leaving insufficient energy for compression. As a result, the engine would stall. The work required for compression is determined as the area under the compression curve on the pressure volume diagram. Since the expansion process is above the compression curve, the entire process provides more work during expansion than is required for the subsequent compression. The difference between the expansion and compression work is the useful mechanical work obtained from the process. This is the net work actually delivered from the crankshaft to the wheels. It is easy to see from the diagram that the useful work is the enclosed area within the thermodynamic cycle. The state curves form what is known as a clockwise cyclic process. Heat engines are basically clockwise cyclic processes so that more work is released during expansion than is required for compression. This is the only way the process can effectively deliver useful work. At this point, let's briefly reconsider the neglected gas exchange loop. Essentially, the charge exchange forms a reverse cyclic process, known as a counterclockwise cyclic process, which runs in the opposite direction. In this case, the expansion curve during the intake lies below the compression curve during the exhaust. For the exhaust, the gas must perform more work than the environment does during the intake. As a counterclockwise cyclic process, work must be done during the charge exchange. The work required corresponds to the enclosed area within the charge exchange loop. However, in the idealized thermodynamic cycle of the gasoline engine, intake and exhaust are at the same pressure, so there is no actual charge exchange loop and therefore no work to be done for charge exchange. The useful work obtained from the auto cycle may at first seem to violate the law of conservation of energy, since we get more work from the expansion than we had to expend for the compression. At this point, we must remember that compression work is not the only energy input we need to consider. We also add a significant amount of heat energy by burning the fuel-air mixture. The useful work produced by the process ultimately comes from this isochoric heat input. However, not all of the heat input can be converted to work because some of the heat energy is actually rejected from the process as hot gases. This corresponds to the heat rejection during the assumed isochoric cooling phase. According to the law of conservation of energy, the difference between the heat supplied, Q in, and the heat rejected, Q out, is not simply lost, but is converted into useful work within the engine. From the two energy flow diagrams, we can see that we can determine the useful work in two ways, either by the difference between expansion and compression work, or by the difference between heat added and heat rejected. Note that both work and heat transfers have positive or negative signs, depending on whether the energy is being added to the gas for example, when heat is added or compression work is done, or removed from the gas for example, when heat is removed or expansion work is done. To avoid misunderstandings, we explicitly use absolute values in the formulas for energies that are actually negative. In the context of environmental impact, the efficiency with which the heat supplied during combustion is actually converted into useful work is of primary interest for internal combustion engines. It represents the ratio of useful work to heat input. Thus, the thermal efficiency clearly indicates how much of the heat input is converted into useful work. For example, a thermal efficiency of 0.6 means that 60% of the input heat energy is converted into useful work. The calculation of the supplied and rejected heat in the auto cycle is relatively straightforward. According to the first law of thermodynamics, in an isochoric process where no work is done, all of the heat goes into changing the internal energy. For an ideal gas, the change in internal energy can be determined using the specific heat capacity at constant volume CV, the gas mass M in the cylinder, and the temperature change delta T. 
Therefore, if the temperature increase during combustion from state 2 to 3 is known, the supplied heat can be calculated using the formula shown. Let's consider an example of a four-cylinder gasoline engine with a maximum cylinder volume of 0.5 liters. The air-fuel mixture is drawn in at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 1 bar and then compressed at a compression ratio of 10. For simplicity, we assume that the air-fuel mixture is pure air with a specific heat capacity of 718 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Using the ideal gas law, we can calculate that the mass of gas in the cylinder is 0.6 grams. For this example, we assume that the temperature rises to a maximum of 2000 degrees Celsius during combustion. The temperatures and pressures of the other states are given directly in the diagram, but we will not go into their calculation here. However, the temperatures and pressures can be determined using the formulas for the isochoric and isentropic processes. The required adiabatic index kappa was assumed to be 1.4. As an exercise, it is recommended that you calculate the temperatures and pressures in the various states yourself. However, to calculate the heat supplied, we only need the temperature change from state 2 to 3, which in this case is 1537 degrees Celsius. Using this temperature change, along with the specific heat capacity and mass of the gas, we obtain a heat energy delivered during combustion of 662 joules. Similarly, the heat rejected during the assumed isochoric cooling from state 4 to 1, can be determined from the temperature change of minus 612 degrees Celsius. In this case, the heat energy is minus 264 joules. The minus sign here simply indicates that heat was removed from the gas due to the temperature decrease. As explained earlier, the difference between the heat supplied and the heat rejected is the useful work. In this way, we obtain a useful work of 398 joules that the engine cylinder delivers through the crankshaft during one cycle of the process. As the ratio of useful work to heat input, we can now also determine the thermal efficiency. With a value of 0.6, the thermal efficiency is 60%. This means that 60% of the heat input is actually converted into useful work, while the remaining 40% is lost as waste heat through the process of exhausting the hot gases. In addition to the heat energies, we can also calculate the work transfers during compression and expansion for the given cycle. By neglecting the heat transfer during isentropic compression, the work done during compression contributes entirely to the internal energy. This change in internal energy for an ideal gas is again determined solely by the temperature change. With a temperature change during compression of 443 degrees Celsius, the work required for compression is 191 joules. In the same way, we can determine the work of expansion from the temperature change during the isentropic expansion. With a temperature drop of minus 1,368 degrees Celsius, we get a work of expansion of minus 589 joules. Again, the negative sign simply means that the gas is doing work during the expansion. As already explained, the difference between the expansion and compression work is the useful work. In this way, we obtain the same useful work as the difference in heat energy, which is 398 joules. From this useful work that the gas in the engine cylinder delivers to the crankshaft during one thermodynamic cycle, we can now determine the engine power as the quotient of the useful work done and the time required to do that work. All we need to know is the time it takes for the work to be done. This happens during each cycle of the thermodynamic process. However, we know that for a four-stroke engine it takes two revolutions of the crankshaft to complete one cycle of the process, so we can determine the duration of the cycle from the rotational speed of the crankshaft. Let's consider an example with an engine speed of 3,000 revolutions per minute, where the calculated useful work of 398 joules per cycle is delivered to the crankshaft. The crankshaft, which ultimately represents the engine shaft, rotates 50 times per second. The time it takes to complete one revolution is simply the reciprocal of this rotational speed. In our example, at a frequency of 50 revolutions per second, the time period is 0.02 seconds. Therefore, one revolution of the crankshaft takes 20 milliseconds. Two rotations of the crankshaft to complete a thermodynamic cycle therefore take 40 milliseconds. On average, the useful work of 398 joules is delivered in 40 milliseconds. Dividing the work by the time gives a power output of about 10 kilowatts. Note that the thermodynamic cycle in the volume pressure diagram typically refers to only a single cylinder. Therefore, the calculated power of 10 kilowatts applies only to one cylinder. For a four-cylinder engine, the calculated power of the cycle must be multiplied by the number of cylinders, 
which in this case is 4. The engine thus has a total power of 40 kilowatts. Similar to the calculation of mechanical power, we can determine fuel consumption based on engine speed. Instead of useful work, we now consider the heat input of 662 joules required per thermodynamic cycle. At an engine speed of 3000 RPM, this cycle is performed 1500 times per minute. Over the course of an hour, there are 90,000 thermodynamic cycles. Therefore, we must supply 662 joules of heat energy 90,000 times in one hour, for a total heat energy of 60 megajoules per hour. The fuel consumption is then derived from the heating value of the gasoline, also called calorific value. The heating value of a substance generally refers to the usable heat energy released per kilogram of the substance when burned. For gasoline, the heating value is approximately 42 megajoules per kilogram. Therefore, for every kilogram of gasoline burned, 42 megajoules of heat energy can be used. Solving this formula for the mass of fuel required, and using the total heat energy of 60 megajoules and the heating value of 42 megajoules per kilogram, we obtain a mass of gasoline of 1.43 kilograms that the engine must burn per hour. Since gasoline is sold at gas stations in liters rather than kilograms, it is useful to convert the consumption of 1.43 kilograms of gasoline per hour to liters. The conversion is based on a fuel density of 0.75 kilograms per liter. This results in a fuel consumption of approximately 1.9 liters per hour. Again, this is for a single cylinder. With a total of four cylinders, the fuel consumption is four times higher, resulting in a total consumption of 7.6 liters per hour. Note that we have neglected heat losses during combustion and assume that all the heat released during combustion is used to heat the gas. In reality, of course, this is not the case. For example, the cylinders also heat up, so some of the heat is dissipated through the cylinder walls and ultimately to the environment rather than to the gas. Finally, a note on the pressure volume diagram shown. In this case, it is only schematic. If the ideal thermodynamic cycle were drawn to scale, the isentropic processes would be much steeper with decreasing volume. This diagram shows the scaled pressure volume diagram for the ideal cycle just considered. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.